Good evening and good morning to everyone joining us today. Um, thank you for uh, coming to this webinar to talk about methane emissions, the, the science and some policy updates. I'm Louise Bedsworth. I'm a senior advisor at the California China Climate Institute, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. Uh, before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, we are recording this event and it will be available on our website um, after the fact. Uh, we are simultaneously translating this event into um, Mandarin Chinese. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little globe icon. And so you can select the language uh, that you would like uh, for, for this event. Uh, we will be going through the presentations and we welcome uh, questions to be put into the Q&A function at the, again, at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can live. We'll go through um, four presentations and then we'll turn to an open uh, question and answer and discussion session. Uh, so uh, we're going to start by hearing a few updates on science and technology around methane emissions and methane detection. First, we'll hear from Dr. Gabrielle Dreyfus, the chief scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. This will be followed by remarks by Dr. Riley Duran, who is the CEO of Carbon Mapper, who will talk about satellite mapping and technologies to track methane emissions. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Dreyfus. Hello, and thank you. I am working to share my screen. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you to Berkeley Law and the California China uh, Climate Institute uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I am Dr. Gabrielle Dreyfus. I'm the chief scientist for the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. And I have the opportunity to tell you why methane is so important for climate and to appreciate why methane is so important, we have to understand times and timescales. First is that we need to slow the pace of warming. We are currently already experiencing the impacts of warming and the rate of warming is accelerating and risking triggering self-reinforcing feedbacks and we are getting close to crossing some climate tipping points. While cutting CO2 is absolutely critical for limiting our warming commitment, because of uh, car slow carbon cycles and co-emissions with CO2 sources, even uh, the most uh, dramatic emissions reductions for CO2 are not fast enough. So what we need is a strategy that is fast for slowing warming and methane, due to the fact that it's both extremely potent as a greenhouse gas and has a relatively short lifetime on the order of 11 years, is the method that, that uh, in the strategy that has the greatest potential to slow warming over the next two decades. It may be, it, and it is the best we know. So we are currently in already experiencing the impacts of climate change at 1.1 to 1.2 Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And it is likely that global average surface temperature will cross 1.5 Celsius in less than 10 years. Indeed, the World Meteorological Organization estimates that we have a likely as not chance of crossing 1.5 at least temporarily in the next four years. And crossing this 1.5 degree threshold is very significant because it is linked to a number of feedbacks and tipping points in the climate system. The most sensitive of these is what is occurring in the Arctic. Indeed, because of various feedback mechanisms in the Arctic, most notably the ice albedo feedback, where the melting of snow and ice reduces the amount of sunlight reflected and absorbs a more incoming solar radiation, the Arctic is already warming at four times faster than the global average rate. We've already lost half of the summer sea ice cover, and we are um, have evidence that we are approaching a tipping point for the disintegration of the Greenland ice sheet. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet 
has an effect on the circulation of the ocean and atmosphere. And we're already seeing slowing of that overturning circulation in the Atlantic. And if we continue to have loss of Arctic summer sea ice, uh, we could, because of that re reduction and reflection, add the equivalent of 1,000 gigatons of CO2 warming equivalent with additional albedo loss and, and increased warming from additional loss of snow and ice cover. And additional feedbacks in the Arctic include methane and CO2 release from permafrost, as well as other methane reserves such as hydrates. So we want to slow down warming and buy time and reduce risk of crossing these tipping points. While cutting CO2, again, is absolutely essential, it is not sufficient to slow warming in the near term. If you look at the blue curve, you will see that even if we were to stop emitting CO2 tomorrow, we would not see appreciable decrease in warming for decades. This is because the carbon cycle is very slow. The concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, once they're there, take decades to centuries to millennia to remove. But we can't just turn off CO2. If you look at the red curve, you see the combined effect of stopping CO2 emissions and the co-emitted aerosols, in particular reflected sulfates. What happens when you stop burning fossil fuels is you stop emitting both the CO2 and those reflective aerosols, and you actually get near-term warming. You can see this when we look at this graph from the most recent IPCC report, which shows a contribution to current warming from a number of pollutants. In red, you can see the carbon dioxide is approximately 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of warming Celsius, compared to methane, which is about 0 0.5, even though the concentration of methane in the atmosphere is about 200 times lower. And then you can see in the red box the sulfur dioxide, which is this reflective aerosol that's co-emitted with burning fossil fuels, in particular diesel and uh, coal. And so methane is an extremely potent short-lived greenhouse gas. And if we apply all of the known mitigation measures, we can actually avoid on the order nearly 0 0.3 degrees of warming by 2050. This is from the global methane assessment by the, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the UN Environment Program. In comparison, this figure, the colorful lines, show that full decarbonization, these are from scenarios that are consistent with a 1.5 degrees of warming uh, future pathways, you see that you actually get near-term warming by this combined effect of reduction in CO2 and sulfates. And because of this Arctic amplification, this reduction of methane emissions can actually reduce Arctic warming by 0 0.5 degrees. This feature of the importance of methane for both near and long-term uh, impacts on surface temperature was recognized in the recent um, IPCC synthesis report released in August, which recognized the importance of strong sustained methane mitigation, in particular for offsetting this potential near-term warming that would accompany decarbonization. A previous study by the UN Environment Program and World Meteorological Organization had identified that cuts to methane and black carbon, another short-lived climate pollutant, could slow the rate of warming in the Arctic by two thirds and cut global warming in half. And hence, it's really important to recognize the, that we need to both do the decarbonization to net zero in 2050 and also prioritize at the same level these deep reductions to methane and other short-lived climate pollutants. And just to emphasize this, that we are not talking about trade-offs, that these are things that we need to do both, that cutting more CO2 will not compensate for the cuts to methane that will slow warming in the near term, nor will cutting methane lead to this long-term warming stabilization we need by cutting CO2. But there's really a need to do both of these strategies, decarbonization and targeted measures, looking at methane. So to summarize, we're actually in three races that we are starting at the same time. There is the sprint, which is what we need to do over the next 10 years to reduce methane emissions dramatically as called for in the Global Methane Pledge, for example. 
and uh, other superfine balloons to slow the pace of warming over the next decade or two. And while we're racing this sprint, we're also running a marathon to decarbonize by 2050, as well as an ultra marathon to develop carbon and methane removal as soon as possible technologies to remove these greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, as well as prepare and research other climate interventions. Thank you very much. With that, I will hand it back. Thank you so much, Dr. Dreyfus. Um, I think that was an excellent review and summary of making the case for why this is so important. And so now we'll hear from Dr. Duran about ways that we can actually start using data to inform our actions. Uh, thank you, um, Louise, and thank you for um, bringing us together to talk about this important topic. Uh, my name is Riley Duran. I'm a chief executive for a new nonprofit called Carbon Mapper, focused on improving uh, understanding of methane and carbon dioxide emissions globally at scales re relevant to decision making. Um, uh, I'm also a research scientist at the University of Arizona. Um, it are some developments on this topic that arise both from my own team's work that started with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California with our partners with California agencies, in particular, the California Air Resources Board, as well as a much larger and international uh, collection of research efforts. This opening slide just offers an illustration of the diversity of methane emissions at the scale of individual operations ranging from waste management to agriculture to fossil fuel activity. And while the focus on this slide is on examples of airborne remote sensing around the United States, we already know with our other measurements and our colleagues around the world that these are uh, everywhere. And so I'm gonna try to give you some insight into how things are advancing and what to look forward to in years to come. So the first thing to know about methane emissions is that they vary significantly by region, um, as well as how they are estimated, the methods that are used to estimate them, and also importantly, their mitigation potential. And so I'll talk a little bit here about all three of those things. Um, this figure on the left is from the global methane assessment completed last year by a, a collection of scientists internationally. And and what it shows is that methane emissions vary by sector, um, by region in some parts of the world. Agriculture and waste management are the largest contributors to the local or regional methane budgets. In other places, fossil fuel emissions, for example, from oil and gas or coal production and use dominate. And so it's important to understand what your uh, emission inventory or budget is in your region um, to prioritize to mitigate those emissions. Uh, the other thing is that uh, estimates of emissions vary according to the methods used. And this figure in the upper right is just an illustration of many studies um, that attempt to break down the emissions budget of a region using two methods. One is using a so-called bottom-up method, emission inventories based on activity information and emission factors. And the other one is the so-called top-down method using direct atmospheric measurements. Both of these techniques have their, their pros and cons. Um, the point I wanna make here is that when you compare them, um, you, you see a couple of things here. In addition to the, the emissions varying by sector, uh, by region, you see that some of these top-down versus bottom-up methods agree very well, in other cases, not so well. And um, the reasons for that are, are complex and represent ongoing research. What I will say is that as you go to finer the spatial scales, that is going from country level down to the, the level of states and provinces, down to the level of individual facilities, the, these discrepancies tend to get larger because you're resolving individual uh, differences that occur for reasons we'll get into in a second. And the last thing to share on the slide is the mitigation potential that varies by sector. And this is a, a great um, figure from a paper from our colleagues at Environmental Defense Fund showing that some sectors are more ripe, so to speak, for mitigation today. And what this figure shows is for each of the key sectors, what the predicted emissions um, mitigation potential 
by 2030 compared to our current baseline. So for example, oil and gas, the assessment is the potential is quite strong for immediate mitigation that is economically feasible. Economically feasible defined here as a net zero cost. And then you'll see further circles in this diagram that go to technically feasible, meaning with the right economic incentives, it's technically possible to achieve steeper reductions. And so this is important to think about when contemplating priorities and addressing commitments such as the Global Methane Pledge that was signed uh, at, the top, at the COP back in November in Glasgow, is that some sectors are more right than others, but it means that there needs to be attention to addressing financial incentives, not just technical uh, methods to mitigate. The good news is, is that there is an emerging global system of systems for measuring and monitoring greenhouse gas emissions, and that includes methane. And we've seen dramatic progress over the last few years. To summarize this, I'd like to point out that um, there's no one size fits all tool for measuring greenhouse gases. And what's emerging is a system of systems or a multi-scale, multi-platform approach. And that's what the artist concept on the left shows, that the community is beginning to use combinations of satellites aircraft, continuous uh, sensors uh, located at, at individual facilities, for example, fence line monitoring, and then periodic surveys with um, handheld instruments on the ground or drones. And even more impressive is the expansion of satellite uh, technology that is relevant to methane monitoring today. These figures here just illustrate a number of satellites that are either in orbit now or are planned for operation soon or have been operating and ceased and are, are being replaced. And the point is, is that scientists around the world, including international collaborations like the one uh, mentioned here, looking at emissions in the Permian Basin, are using these multiple satellites from uh, different countries to look at methane collectively. And so the, the capability to measure methane from space is emerging dramatically and will continue to grow over the next several years. And so these are important tools that we can, we can put to use. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. In terms of combining these measurements from different platforms, this is an example from uh, field studies done in Southwest Pennsylvania. And most of the methane that we're gonna see here comes from coal mining and gas production. So the figure on the left is a map of methane emissions derived from satellite observations, in this case, the Sentinel-5 precursor mission, Tropomi. And this map shows, generally speaking, somewhat coarsely where the methane emissions are. Um, but more importantly, it gives us a constraint on the total emissions from that region. So now if we zoom into Southwest Pennsylvania, and this is the animation on the right, now using airborne remote sensing, we can image individual plumes of methane gas and quantify those emission rates. And what you're gonna see as the airplane moves overhead is that the larger plumes in this image are emissions from coal mine venting in the area. And the smaller plumes, little purple dots you see here and there are emissions from gas production, wellheads, gas lines, tank batteries, compressor stations. And it's by putting these two measurement techniques together that we get a more complete understanding both at the individual facility scale as well as the net impact at regional scale to provide context. Another topic I want to bring up is super emitters. The so-called super emitter is a phenomenon that's been observed in basically every methane emission sector and that is in many cases in many regions a small fraction of the infrastructure is disproportionately responsible for emissions. For example, in many cases, we see that less than 1% of the infrastructure in a region is responsible for between 20 and 60% of the regional totals. And we've seen this in California with the study we published a few years ago, and we see it in other uh, important basins around the US. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is that in many cases, these so-called super emitters are highly intermittent. This animation on the right shows a map of methane emissions in the Permian Basin and in, in New Mexico and Texas in the United States. And if you were to stare at some of these dots, you would see that some of them actually persist. They don't go away completely, but a lot of the other ones are moving around quite a bit. And this just underscores the importance of routine frequent measurements because going out and making a measurement once a year or once a quarter will result in missing a lot of the emissions because this is a very dynamic system. And again, it's not just limited to oil and gas. We see this sort of dynamic 
in, in many methane sectors. So there are many ways to apply methane data using these advanced methods to support mitigation action. And without going into a lot of detail, those uh, opportunities range, for, range from support for leak detection and repair at oil and gas facilities to understanding uh, where wasteful venting occurs, even if it's permitted, it should be reducible. And so that can guide decisions about engineering and policy improvements. Additionally, in some other sectors like waste management and agriculture, advanced methane measurements can help us understand where the emission models are missing, um, uh, things like management practices or uh, gaps in capture systems. And so they can help us inform and improve best practices or priorities for future investment to address those emission sectors as well. And, and last but not least, let's remember that methane is also an ozone precursor. And in some cases, methane is co-emitted with other compounds that can be toxic or hazardous to human health. And so there are other co-benefits of addressing methane, uh, including air quality and, uh, and health. Some of the field work that's been done in California and other places around the US using advanced measurement methods uh, is demonstrating that some of this technology can actually enable and support uh, enhanced mitigation. And this example I'm showing you from Southern California shows about 20 facilities, and that's what the green triangles represent, where we shared airborne data. And you see some examples here with these animations, this at an oil well, this at a power plant, where providing data to an operator allowed them to pinpoint the source of the emission. In all of these cases I'm highlighting, the operators determined after investigation that these were leaks or malfunctions and they repaired them. In fact, when we share this data more broadly, working with our partners in the Air Resources Board and the private sector, the reports that we get back are about half of these super emitters are, are deemed fixable or repairable by operators. So this indicates that there is low hanging fruit, so to speak, by focusing attention on super emitters. In this case, uh, quite a bit of methane has been mitigated already over the last couple of years, just by engaging with eight companies and this part of the state. So my last slide, I'm just gonna comment on um, how some of these satellite programs are evolving. Carbon Mapper is a public-private partnership that was established in California two years ago. Carbon Mapper being the nonprofit that leads it. Our plan is to continue to deploy airborne assets to make these sorts of measurements internationally. But starting next year, our plan is to launch two satellites that will eventually be built out into a larger constellation, ultimately providing daily monitoring at facility scale of high emission methane and CO2 sources globally. The objective of this program is to get 90% completeness in terms of our ability to see these high emission events because of high frequency and high resolution measurements and also dense coverage. So we're trying not to miss much. And also equally important is all of the methane and CO2 data will be made publicly available globally. And that's important because it, the data needs to be accessible and transparent to have the maximum impact. So if I can get off of this slide, uh, I'll thank you for your attention. If you wanna learn more about this program, please go to our website and please also be aware that there are multiple programs that are related that I point out here that have really significant resources, not just in, the, in California and China, but, uh, but internationally. And I, I encourage you to reach out to these organizations and, and happy to happy to collaborate and connect with you on that. Thank you. Great, thank you both so much. Those were really um, informative uh, presentations. We're now gonna turn to hear some policy updates. Unfortunately, one of our speakers from the California Resources Board had a last minute um, emergency come up is not able to make it, but we will hear from uh, Tomas Carbonell from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where he is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Stationary Sources. Uh, so we'll hear about some work happening at the federal level, and then we'll hear from Stephanie Rucker from the Colorado Air Pollution Control Division and hear about some subnational activities happening in Colorado. So with that, I'll turn over to you, Tomas. Thank you, Louise, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join the discussion today. Let me just put my slides up on the screen here. Hope everyone can see that. Um, 
So today I really want to focus on um, EPA's most recent effort to address methane emissions from the oil and gas sector under the Clean Air Act. Um, but towards the end of my remarks, I'll also try to touch on um, some work that EPA does uh, in the international space to reduce methane emissions, and most particularly um, our close partnership with, with China on this issue. So the, the effort that I'm going to discuss, the rulemaking effort, um, is a top priority for this administration. And I think that was um, reflected first in an executive order that President Biden uh, issued on day one of his presidency, which addressed um, both public health and climate change and directed EPA to review existing regulations and to consider new regulations uh, to reduce methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. Uh, nine and a half months later, on November 2nd of 2021, um, EPA issued this proposal. And as another reflection of the importance that the administration uh, places on this effort, um, that proposal was uh, released in conjunction with the launch of the Global Methane Pledge uh, and the release of the US um, Methane Emission Reduction Action Plan, um, which speaks to actions that agencies across the federal government, uh, including USDA, the Department of the Interior, um, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Transportation uh, are all taking to reduce methane emissions from multiple sectors. Uh, there's a good reason why um, the administration has placed such a high priority on reducing methane from the oil and gas sector um, in particular. And that's, of course, because the oil and natural gas sector is the nation's largest industrial source of methane, uh, which is, all, as we all heard um, earlier in this webinar, uh, is a really potent driver of the climate change that we're now experiencing. But in addition to that, uh, the oil and gas sector, along with methane, uh, emits large quantities of other harmful pollutants, uh, including volatile organic compounds, which contribute to ground level ozone or smog in many parts of the country, as well as hazardous air pollutants like benzene. So this rulemaking really um, affords an opportunity um, to secure multi-pollutant benefits um, that address both uh, climate and health harming pollution and to do that in a very cost-effective way. So what does the proposed rule that we issued last fall uh, propose to do? Um, first, it would expand and strengthen uh, what we call new source performance standards, uh, which are currently on the books for methane and for VOCs uh, from new and modified and reconstructed sources in the oil and natural gas industry. At the same time, it would establish emission guidelines for states to follow in reducing methane emissions from existing sources nationwide uh, for the first time. As I'll describe in a moment, it will secure major climate and health benefits, and it will do that by leveraging both innovative technologies, um, including some of the uh, innovative uh, methane detection techniques that Dr. Durand has pointed to, as well as proven and cost-effective solutions uh, that major oil and gas producing states and leading companies have already been deploying to minimize or eliminate this harmful pollution. One thing I'll just note before going to the next slide is that this really draws on um, the extensive experience um, and solutions that we've seen proven out at both the state and industry level and draws from extensive public input um, and outreach that we undertook in the months leading up to the proposal, um, including outreach to communities, um, to state energy and environmental regulators, um, to industry uh, and to environmental and public health NGOs. I'll just quickly review some of the um, both climate and health benefits associated with the rule. Um, EPA estimates um, that this rule would achieve significant reductions in both methane pollution as well as VOCs and hazardous air pollution. The proposal would reduce methane pollution from the sources that it covers by 74% by 2030 relative to 2005 levels. And through 2035, those reductions would be equivalent to about 920 million metric tons of CO2 which is more than the combined annual emissions of passenger vehicles and aircraft in the US in 2019. Through that same period, it would also reduce about 12 million tons of VOCs and 480,000 tons of air toxics such as benzene. These would translate into really significant um, cl monetized climate benefits. Um, we estimate that the total net benefits above and, and beyond the costs of the proposal um, would be 48 to $49 billion um, from 2023 through 2035. Uh, and that um, amounts to about $4.5 billion a year uh, in, in net climate benefits. And this does not even attempt to uh, monetize the health benefits that are associated with the VOC and HAP reductions that I mentioned. 
I want to say just a little bit about some of the specific emission reduction measures um, that are really at the heart of this proposal. Uh, many of these measures, as I mentioned earlier, reflect highly cost-effective, well-demonstrated solutions um, that leading companies or states are already deploying. And in addition, um, attempt to um, leverage innovative methane detection technologies and other cutting edge solutions um, that we've seen a lot of stakeholders, um, including industry, um, express support for. Uh, the first and, and, and one of the most important measures um, that I wanted to discuss is finding and fixing uh, leaks from both well sites and compressor stations. This is a really vital aspect of the proposal because as we've already heard uh, today, leaks or fugitive emissions are, are one of the largest sources of methane um, that we see in the oil and natural gas sector. And to address that source, the proposal includes a comprehensive monitoring program that requires companies to find and fix leaks at well sites and compressor stations using optical gas imaging instruments or equivalent technology. This program is designed to focus monitoring efforts on the sites and equipment um, that are most prone uh, to malfunctions and to have large emissions. And alongside this camera-based um, mon regulatory monitoring requirement that I've described, uh, we also create a role for innovative technologies by proposing to give owners and operators um, the option to utilize uh, advanced detection technologies, uh, such as aerial surveys or mobile monitoring units um, to detect um, methane or to carry out these required surveys uh, at well sites and compressor stations. And we really hope that will encourage the deployment of technologies that can detect these leaks more rapidly and, and cost effectively than ever before. A second key measure involves a piece of equipment called pneumatic controllers, where the proposal uh, includes uh, a requirement um, that these controllers uh, transition to zero emitting technologies. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with these devices, um, natural gas driven pneumatic controllers are used extensively um, in uh, the production through the transmission and storage segments of the oil and gas industry. And they're designed to discharge uh, natural gas through their routine operation um, to the atmosphere. And this accounts for a really large share of the US methane inventory from oil and gas. Um, so the proposal um, by uh, requiring zero emissions um, from basically all sites except uh, remote sites without power in Alaska um, would go a long ways towards addressing this really important source. A third major measure that I wanted to address was um, associated gas, um, which is produced along with oil um, at many oil wells in the United States. Um, in many cases, the uh, gas is produced along with the oil um, is vented or flared because there's no sales line uh, available. Uh, under the proposal, we would uh, prohibit the venting of that gas and require um, high performance flaring uh, in order to reduce methane emissions associated with vented uh, associated gas. And where a sales line is available, operators would be required uh, to route, uh, to capture and route that gas to the sales line. In addition to these uh, key components, there are also standards that address methane and VOC emissions from liquids unloading operations uh, at natural gas wells, uh, from storage vessels, which are a major source of emissions and um, frequently associated with malfunctions that lead to high, high, high uh, emission events, uh, compressors and pneumatic pumps, uh, again, addressing uh, new and existing sources in all of these uh, categories. I just want to say a little bit about um, the coverage of the proposal with respect to the different segments in the oil and natural gas sector. Um, basically, for the sources that I just described, uh, the proposed rule um, would address those sources wherever they occur um, from the production uh, segment of the industry all the way up to uh, what we call the city gate, which is where the local distribution systems uh, that serve uh, retail customers um, begin. Portions of the system that are not covered by our proposal which include um, underground pipelines uh, and those distribution systems um, are often regulated um, by the Federal Department of Transportation um, or by the states. Speaking of the states, I just wanna address a key component of the proposal, which is our emission guidelines. And these speak to uh, emission reduction requirements for existing sources. Um, under the provisions of the Clean Air Act that we are relying on for this proposal, states have a really key role in developing plans to address emissions from existing sources. Uh, and under our proposal, states would have to limit emissions from the sources that I just mentioned, um, with the exception of liquids unloading, which is always considered a new, a new source under our proposal. 
the um, proposal for existing sources contains what we call presumptive standards that really provide clear guidance for the states um, and can be incorporated directly into state plans um, and approved by EPA. Um, and for the sources that I just mentioned, the standards for existing sources are basically the same as those for new sources uh, in almost all instances. Um, at the same time, the proposal does recognize that many states have existing programs that they um, would want, may want to use uh, in order to uh, limit uh, methane pollution in accordance with this rule, um, and may want the flexibility to develop new programs as well. And so where states can demonstrate that those existing programs or new programs are equally effective um, to our uh, proposed uh, uh, presumptive standards, um, the proposal provides a pathway um, for those innovative plans to, to be approved. Um, I want to say just a, a little bit about the next steps for this proposal. We're taking public comment right now through uh, Monday, January 31st. Um, later this year, we intend to follow on the proposal by issuing a supplemental proposal. And the intent of the supplemental proposal is really to enable EPA to issue a final rule that is both ambitious from a climate and health point of view, um, but also cost-effective, um, workable, um, and legally durable. And what the supplemental proposal will allow us to do is um, first, you know, potentially address sources of methane that we were not able to address in the November proposal. And we've taken comment on a few additional types of sources like abandoned wells um, that might fall into that description. Um, in addition, the supplemental proposal will give us an opportunity to revisit innovative aspects of the proposal, like our treatment of advanced detection technologies, um, and take account of public input and make sure we're getting those innovative features right. Um, as we move towards the final rule. Um, we'll take public comment on the supplemental proposal as well, and we'll work towards issuing a final rule as swiftly as we can. So that's a key piece of our domestic work at EPA on methane reductions. Um, before I wrap up, just wanted to note that we also do extensive work uh, internationally um, to partner with um, both countries uh, and, and the private sector uh, to reduce methane. Since 2004, an important element of that work has been our work through the Global Methane Initiative, which is a public-private partnership um, that focuses on reducing methane across several major sectors, including uh, oil and gas, as well as coal mining, um, agriculture, uh, and uh, waste and wastewater. From the beginning, uh, China has been a key partner in this effort. And over many years, EPA has worked with China to provide technical assistance to build capacity um, and to identify potential opportunities for mitigation projects um, through initiatives like the China Coal Information Institute, as well as collaboration uh, with the UNACE um, to establish the International Center for Excellence for Coal Mine Methane in China. Um, in Glasgow, uh, we were very proud to sign with China a joint declaration on enhancing climate action that highlighted, highlighted a number of different areas in which the US and China intend to collaborate on climate issues, um, including collaboration on methane. So we really look forward to continuing that work uh, and to making progress on this important issue, um, which has important ramifications both for climate and for health. So thank you all and I look forward to the Q&A after, after our presentations. Thank you so much, Tomas, that was terrific. Um, and we will now turn to Stephanie Rucker who will talk about work underway in Colorado. All right, thank you. And thank you, Tomas. I uh, really enjoyed all of the presentations so far, actually. So my name is Stephanie Rucker. I am with the Colorado Air Pollution Control Division in the Office of Innovations and Planning. Um, my history, I guess, within air quality has largely been in oil and gas, but it's also been in, in other areas. And we are definitely making a lot of efforts to reduce greenhouse gases kind of across all sectors within Colorado. And so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we are doing in Colorado and uh, hopefully answer questions that you might have. So there's been quite a bit of, of legislative activity. Um, so like many states, we have been limited in the past in terms of our ability to regulate things like methane or greenhouse gases as our statutes, our state statutes didn't allow uh, for, for that specifically. And so while we have done over, over the past many years, um, done a lot to reduce VOC emissions, which 
in turn also has helped reduce methane emissions in many cases. Uh, we have never been able to specifically target greenhouse gases in Colorado until this 2019 bill uh, was signed called the Climate Action Plan to Reduce Pollution. This action plan established goals by 2025, 2030, and 2050 to reduce Colorado-wide greenhouse gas emissions. And it breaks it down into the different sectors. So industrial, power, transportation, oil and gas um, is, is under industrial. So we have um, quite a number of areas where we have broken down what it is that we have to do to accomplish these 2025, 2030, and 2050 goals. We also had a recent House bill um, last year uh, in 2021 called the Environmental Justice and Disproportionately Impacted Communities Bill. And really this one wasn't necessarily a climate change bill, although climate equity was definitely a piece of it. It was focused on encouraging or in requiring uh, for us as the state, as we were creating rules to consider environmental justice and consider our disproportionately impacted communities in the development of these rules. Um, so that is a big piece of it, but it also established in addition to the, the kind of statewide goals that were in the 191261, it established very specific oil and gas sector targets in 21-1266. So we are dealing with those now. After the statute, of course, comes all of the regulatory activity as we have been given um, authority to move forward with regulations related to greenhouse gases. And so it's been uh, kind of all hands on deck within the Air Pollution Control Division attempting to uh, accommodate all of the legislative activity, meet the requirements, um, and ultimately put us on the right path towards these 2025 and 2030 goals with plans in the future of continuing that effort to get us to the 2050 goals as well. The first thing really that uh, was tackled was related to just greenhouse gas reporting. Um, while EPA has a greenhouse gas reporting program, they do have a relatively high threshold in terms of what types of facilities have to report to that uh, greenhouse gas registry. And so we in Colorado created our own greenhouse gas reporting program and requirements that includes uh, quite a bit more um, and much smaller facilities um, so that we are getting a more comprehensive look at what the emissions are from various uh, sectors within Colorado. We've also recently uh, had our commission adopt oil and gas specific rules, upstream and midstream rules related to uh, reduction of greenhouse gas. It was the first, or is the first oil and gas specific greenhouse gas rule that we've ever been able to uh, pass in Colorado. We've got a number of areas that we're working on related to transportation, whether it's um, looking at low emission vehicles and no emission vehicles, as well as trying to reduce single occupancy vehicles and um, encourage either less commuting or uh, just uh, car hours out on the, on the roads. We recently uh, had this greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency manufacturing uh, rulemaking. So that was in November, it was adopted by our commission. And then we're also working on an HFC phase out. And so that will be another component of a lot of the regulatory activity that's gone on already. Um, and then there's quite a bit more that's planned over the course of the next few years. So not everything has to happen through regulation. And so some of this we've been able to move forward with in terms of uh, developing different policies and um, working on either voluntary actions or, or otherwise. And so the first thing that we, we did as an, as an agency was to develop the Colorado Greenhouse Gas Reduction Roadmap. And really that was taking those 2025, 2030, and 2050 requirements and breaking it into sectors and saying, this is where we have to get emission reductions from. This is where they are, and this is where we have to 
to get them um, across those different sectors. So some sectors are much easier to get re emission reductions from than others. Um, as, as many of you probably already know, it's a lot easier to require a stationary source or a facility or a power plant or whatever to do something than it is to require a person who's driving a car to do something very specific. And so there are areas where we are going to um, acknowledge that we're gonna have more difficulty getting those uh, emission reductions, but they're all part of this roadmap to get emission reductions across the board. Another thing that um, just came out of last year of the 2021 legislative session for Colorado was the development of the Clean Fleet Enterprise. And so this is going to be, uh, again, how I uh, just mentioned that reducing um, car miles and, and car time, part of that is getting better cars on the road. And this Clean Fleet Enterprise is one innovative way to try to do that, um, to get more no emission vehicles and low emission vehicles out there. We're also developing a number of other types of programs, um, these clean heat plans, the employee traffic reduction program, where we're trying to uh, discourage um, either commuting or uh, and driving into work or single occupancy vehicles and people driving into work themselves instead of carpooling with others. Um, Working on oil and gas transmission. Uh, so I mentioned before that the recent rule that we com we completed in December was for upstream and midstream. It didn't include kind of the downstream, which is really the transmission sector. And so that's uh, something that we're working on. We're looking at um, a clean trucking strategy and how do we encourage um, trucks being used to haul all kinds of equipment or deliver packages or otherwise. Uh, to reduce their emissions and then also building efficiency standards. And kind of the, the last piece, I guess, of all of the work that we're doing in Colorado is around trying to better understand what the emissions actually are. Um, so I mentioned before that we have a more much more comprehensive reporting program to get information from whomever about uh, emissions. So this is kind of that bottom up inventory that we've been building for a number of years, but we are going to be incorporating a lot more of this top down information to try to better understand what the actual emissions are, as opposed to relying on bottom up inventories that may not always be completely accurate. And so we have quite a few air monitoring efforts that are currently ongoing. Uh, the air quality enterprise was actually developed in the in the 2020 uh, legislative session, and its focus is entirely 100% on air research and air uh, collection of air quality data, and the kind of taking it out of the the division and taking it out of um, industry's hands and really having a science based. Um, trustworthy organization that can take and collect and provide funding for certain types of data collection. We also have some monitoring studies that are ongoing and uh, uh, Dr. Duran actually mentioned one of them or was talking about the, the carbon mapper. Carbon mapper has actually been doing some of our aerial surveys um, out of a, a specific fund that was developed in response to uh, uh, an action at an, a tragic accident that happened in Colorado that uh, in a settlement we created a fund, we were able to create a fund to fund a lot of um, oil and gas specific monitoring activities and so there's a lot of things happening in this realm and then also uh, for Colorado meaning from from the division ourselves in addition to our stationary uh, monitors that we have out in various places, we now actually have two potential mobile labs um, that can go out. The CAMEL is the air monitoring lab. It is the type of lab that you take and you park somewhere for a week or two weeks or five weeks, um, depending on, on the situation. And you collect uh, samples continuously during that time. 
The Moose is our newest one. It's the Mobile Optical Oil and Gas Sensor of Emissions, and that's what that picture is. And it actually will drive around um, our various areas of a high concentration of either oil and gas activity or otherwise, and be able to uh, detect large emission events that are, uh, I guess, um, something that we can actually um, detect from ground level as opposed to something that's uh, going to be too high for the, the van to be able to collect. So we've got those uh, two that are out there on a regular basis as well. So that is it for us in Colorado and, and everything that we've got going on, which is uh, frankly a lot, just putting this together, um, showed me that. And I will stop sharing and we'll get to the question and answer session. Great, thank you all so much. Those were terrific um, presentations and uh, really exciting to see the work that's underway and the advances in, in science and technology to help us solve these challenges. So I would invite um, anyone who has a question to go ahead and put it into the question and answer um, function and we will answer as many questions as we're able to. Um, perhaps we'll just to get started, um, I'll ask a question of Dr. Dreyfus, um, which is if you could tell us a little bit about efforts um, globally, we have the Global Methane Pledge um, and a lot of activity happening. What, what are some strategies that we can use to really spur action globally to address, you know, in an urgent manner, uh, you know, achieving these reductions? It's an excellent question. I think that the uh, movement and momentum coming out of the Glasgow COP with both the Global Methane Pledge that over 100 countries joined in a very brief period of time between when it was first announced by the US and the European Union in September and when it was formally launched in November. And then again, as uh, as, as uh, Tomas uh, Carbonell was pointing out, the joint declaration, Glasgow declaration between the, the US and China that includes um, a methane uh, action plan uh, is, is quite significant because as we've seen from these presentations, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to better and more accurately understand the sources, especially as uh, Dr. Duran was showing that there are some sources that are, are intermittent, um, that a better monitoring to uh, assess these sources, better awareness and commitments. And what really needs to happen is uh, taking that improved knowledge uh, to the next step with some kind of global methane instrument that will um, essentially uh, take what, build on the momentum to have a greater a political commitment to actually making the reductions that we need to uh, get us on this pathway uh, to keeping 1.5 alive and reducing risks from these feedbacks and tipping points that are so much closer uh, than most people realize. Great, thank you. Um, we do have one question that came in uh, through the chat, um, which uh, talks about the the U.S.-China uh, Glasgow agreement in Glasgow, and really, and the um, the intentions to develop additional measures to enhance methane emission control at both the national and subnational levels. Um, and in its recently communicated NDC, China has in, announced that it intends to develop a national action plan on methane. Uh, and so I think the question is on what issues can states and the federal agencies of the United States and China um, promote implementation of this agreement? And are there specific subnational um, opportunities to advance implementation of the US-China-Glasgow um, agreement? And so I think maybe you all have a little bit of, of thoughts on that, but um, does anyone wanna start? And so what, what sort of opportunities exist? Tomas. Oh, yeah, I, I can, I can, um, you know, take a first cut of that question. I would really welcome other thoughts from from fellow panelists. Um, I'll, I'll just note that it was, you know, extremely exciting uh, to see this joint declaration as one of the um, sort of, uh, you know, um, 
uh, Accords uh, reached at, at, at Glasgow. Uh, and I think it really opens up our opportunities both in, in the US and China um, to drive um, uh, innovation uh, as well as uh, emission reductions um, in this space. And uh, I, I can't speak to the subnational opportunities, but I'll just note that at the federal level, um, we're, we're actively engaged in conversations about you know, how, how we can uh, implement this agreement, uh, what areas uh, are, are most productive to engage on. Um, and I'll just say, you know, gen generally, I think there's just a lot of opportunities um, to share uh, information and research um, you know, across um, uh, both countries um, to um, share solutions, um, including uh, information about um, you know, programs like um, the oil and gas program that I described earlier today and um, uh, uh, in, in ways that might be applicable um, across borders. Um, and uh, to um, you know, share uh, best practices and techniques in areas like uh, methane measurement and inventory development um, that I think are gonna be you know, beneficial um, for both countries um, to address um, you know, their complex sources of methane. Uh, so I hope, I hope that's um, somewhat helpful in addressing at the federal level, you know, some potential areas of collaboration. Great. And do you see from a sector specific, do you think there are certain sectors? I mean, I know you all have obviously been focusing quite a bit on oil and gas. Is that a place where you see a high priority for sort of starting that collaboration and cooperation? Well, certainly, certainly that's one. I, I, and I should say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a deep expert on, <laughs> on this aspect, but, I, but I, my understanding is that um, uh, China, particularly with, with regard to coal mining, has significant methane emissions. And a lot of our work through the Global Methane Initiative has been focused on that sector. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's uh, a fair amount of experience that's been developed in the US uh, in addressing that sector um, and not just at EPA. Um, and, and, and my guess is that that would be a very fruitful area for, for collaboration. Um, although I think, you know, there's probably opportunities across all of the major sectors. Um, I can um, I can try to add to that. I think um, you got my video muted, but um, this is Riley. I'll just add that um, one specific sector where we're learning a lot, I think, in California and other U.S. states is waste management. Um, and so, while it is true that I think the most shovel-ready sector for mitigation is oil and gas. Um, because a lot of the technology, it's all built system. A lot of the technology and investments are there to act on it, um, given the right incentives. Waste management might be next. Agriculture is hard um, because addressing methane emissions from agriculture is not just a technological solution. It may have to do with changing dietary uh, norms around the world. But, um, but when it comes to waste management, what we're learning in places like California is that many of the models that predict the methane emissions don't accurately capture all behavior. There is outlier behavior that is both a function of leak detection, I mean, sorry, leaks in um, the built systems that are supposed to capture gas in managed landfills, but there are also some problematic practices uh, that result in excessive methane and fugitives that are not captured in the models. And so to the extent that we're learning lessons about where those, um, where those uh, fails or those gaps occur and can pass those lessons on to other jurisdictions and maybe compare notes on the most cost-effective ways to find and correct those, those problematic practices and leaks. I think those are. I think that's a really good area um, to look at for collaboration uh, between between states and provinces that have similar infrastructure, and not just U.S. and China, but you know internationally. I think that applies to many uh, participants in the Global Methane Pledge. Great, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on this, or I will. I can move on to the next question. Um, and this is a question I'm not sure if, um, if anyone's going to have a, a, a detailed answer to provide, but I want to put it out there, which is what specific measures can be taken to reduce methane in the biogas sector? And I don't know if anyone on the panel has, has thoughts on that. I don't know, Tomas, or, or if that's like EPA has worked on, or Riley, I saw you unmute. <laughs> yeah, but again, I can just comment with some examples from California. Um, in California, um, the number one or two emission sector is agriculture. In California, uh, we have a lot of factory 
um, farming operations. Uh, EPA refers to them as confined animal feeding operations, particular dairies in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and California has been pretty forward leaning in deploying controlling technologies like methane digesters, which capture a lot of the methane from manure management and repurpose it and can be used to generate electricity. Um, it's important to follow through and monitor leaks in those systems, but that's, that's one approach. Uh, and again, I think there is huge potential in managing biogas um, uh, with, land, with design of, of managed landfills and, and organic waste diversion. It's another thing that we're seeing in, in, in some jurisdictions is diverting a lot of the green waste out of landfills and composting it. Again, if you pay attention to managing the fugitives, that's, that's a, a big step to, to cutting down on emissions from, from the landfills. And I'll, I'll, I'll just note that uh, from the EPA side, you know, bi biogas digesters, um, obviously not the only technology available to reduce methane from the ag sector broadly, um, but, it, but it is a key opportunity and, and one that EPA has been very focused on. Um, for many years, we've had a partnership um, with USDA called AgStar, um, which has worked on um, the deployment of, of biogas digesters um, uh, in the United States. Um, so uh, just to sort of add to, to Riley's comments. Thank you. Um, and I know well, here's another question actually for EPA. Uh, if uh, EPA has done the ground ozone source apportionment uh, to identify the contribution of methane emissions to the background concentration of ozone. Yeah, and, um, I can just address that question generally. I mean, this is an issue that um, uh, our Office of Air and Radiation has examined carefully and. Uh, my understanding, at least, is that um, methane compared to VOCs is not very reactive, um, and so it doesn't contribute substantially to localized uh, ozone, at least in the United States, um, which is one reason why we haven't regulated it as an ozone precursor in the past. Um, that said, um, you know, we recognize that it does contribute to background levels of ozone. Um, and uh, is, is an important uh, element um, to, uh, that, uh, to, 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 to that background um, uh, level of, and, and has important public health impacts in that respect. And uh, that's an important um, benefit to take into account when considering um, uh, the overall benefits of methane reductions. Thank you. And I don't know, Stephanie, if you have anything to add on that really around the health benefits, um, you know, since you all are sitting as an air pollution control um, entity, you know, if there's uh, how that's fitting into the work you all are doing now that you're sort of tasked with both the greenhouse gas emissions and, and how you're building that in on the air quality side as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, ozone has been a, a huge focus of ours over the last many years. Um, since we initially went out of attainment with the ozone standard in 2008. And so we, and we have also seen the ozone standard go down <laughs> since 2008. And so uh, you, we're chasing um, the ozone standard. But, you know, we, we've seen that methane does have some contribution, but it's, it is, as uh, Tomas mentioned, Pretty, pretty small in terms of contribution to ozone. But we also see, because oil and gas is one of our biggest um, emitters in Colorado, we get a lot of benefit by, uh, on both, um, both sides in terms of ozone reduction uh, by, by going after um, oil and gas sources and reducing methane and VOC, we're able to, to accomplish both. We're also going to be turning in the, the near term really to NOx reductions to be able to accomplish ozone reductions because we're getting to the point where it's, it's NOx that is um, what is allowing it to continue uh, to be above. And the benefit of going after NOx reductions in some cases is that if we are looking at replacing cars on the road, if we're looking at replacing um, combustion equipment that's out in the field in the oil and gas sector or otherwise, we're also going to be able to get some CO2 reductions there as well. So we definitely are always looking at this from the perspective of how can we get the most reductions out of for all of the different programs. 
Um, we also are really focused again on this disproportionately impacted communities because we have a lot of communities that are very nearby big industrial sources or oil and gas sources. And so that's where you're really looking at air toxics and what is the effect, the cumulative effect of uh, exposure to air toxics over time in those kind of very localized situations. And so once again, to the extent that we can get benefits uh, kind of across the board, that's what we've been focused on. Great, thank you. There's a question here that I think actually a number of you will have um, perspectives on. Um, which is around the degree of cooperation or and or resistance um, as you're starting as you're looking and focus on the oil and gas industry and, and but also I think Riley just in the broad work that you all are doing as you're tracking sort of site specific emissions how is that working you know when you're sharing those data um, it sounded like Riley you gave several examples where they were very very responsive and able to address issues but I'm curious, um, you know, from a regulatory perspective, also, you know, as a data provider or, or, or someone who's measuring, um, you know, how that, what that dynamic has been like. Yeah, I, I can answer that because I've been working not just with Riley, but also with others. And we have taken very much a wanting to protect, um, protect the integrity of the studies that are being done in terms of we don't want to come in and shut down too much of it while we're still trying to understand what is happening. We also have um, some of our universities are actually working directly with operators and so they're getting feedback, you know, they're, they're having these conversations about, okay, we saw this, what is it? And they have, you know, non-disclosure agreements amongst themselves and so we're not really involved in that. And so what we what we have established with these um, with these researchers who are out there gathering data either at ground level or aerial is we've kind of come up with a you know, threshold of when do they let us know? Um, you know, if it's a traditional leak or it's a traditional super emitter that maybe isn't causing an immediate concern, then they're going to continue on their way. But if it passes a threshold of it's really, really big and we saw it more than once and it's very near a populated area or it's not associated with the facility, maybe it's coming from the ground. Um, in some of those cases, we've been able to see that and therefore it could indicate a pipeline leak, for example. Um, in those cases, they've gone ahead and let us know. And then we've been coordinating with COGCC, um, with FEMSA to the extent that we need to do that uh, to make sure that we are protecting the immediate health and safety of Colorado. And so that's, that's how we have been approaching it because again, we wanna protect the integrity of the research program and the research projects that are being done. One, if I can add to that one. Yeah, um, please. One challenge with so-called third-party reporting, um, that is, it's not measurements being made by, other, but a third party detects a methane emission, is what I call jurisdictional fragmentation. So I'll, an example that we worked on with Steph and her team in Colorado last summer is one of our flights detected a persistent methane super emitter out in a field. Uh, and we reported it within a day or two of seeing it. Um, and after about a week, um, with coordinating with our co uh, collaborators in Colorado and with, and with the Colorado agencies, a team was sent out on the ground and it took a while for them to detect it. Uh, first of all, they couldn't see it with an optical gas imager. They had to use different technologies to find it. And then when they found it, it took a while to isolate it. It wasn't a wellhead. It was actually an adjacent gathering line. And that, that means it's an entirely different entity jurisdiction and different state agencies as opposed to someone who might have jurisdiction over the wellhead. So in some cases, there's a challenge in finding out who do you call first. And so it, it, we do need, in some cases, we need the equivalent of a first responder um, function to methane notification just to make sure you've got the right people contacted before you answer the question of, well, are they responsive? And so that's, that's important to recognize because the, I, I would say a diverse ecosystem of regulators in terms of responsibility. And there are things we could do, I think, to streamline uh, that, that process. 
Thank you. And I don't know, Tomas, you mentioned it sounds like this is some maybe a topic of sort of these more innovative and advanced technology measurement systems that you guys are looking at in the supplemental rulemaking that you discussed. Um, what has the reaction been as you guys have been going through the rulemaking process? I don't know if you could share what you've heard, um, you know, how folks are thinking through the different sort of data and measurement. Sure, and um, just just to elaborate a bit on how you know we acknowledge these technologies in the proposed rule. You know, basically the proposed rule has kind of a, a core regulatory monitoring element to it, which is based on optical gas imaging, as I mentioned, um, and includes you know routine surveys of well sites and compressor stations. And for well sites, you know the, the focus is on well sites that have that are more complex and that are more likely to have large emissions. Um, but alongside that, there's this compliance option. Um, which is meant to be technology neutral in the sense that it can accommodate a large variety of advanced detection technologies and was really designed with um, technologies like satellites and aerial surveys in mind. And under that alternative pathway, we've proposed some basic requirements. So there's like a performance requirement um, included in the proposal in terms of a, a detection threshold that the technology has to meet. There's a minimum number of surveys that have to be undertaken per year. I think it's uh, six surveys per year. Um, and then there's a requirement that there be on top of that an annual optical gas imaging survey um, to ensure that, that small leaks that may not be detected um, by, by these technologies are captured. Um, so we're really interested in input sort of on all of those elements. Like that, that would be the first time we've really created a role for, for these technologies in a regulatory program uh, under the Clean Air Act. Um, and you know, we're really interested in, in feedback on uh, how effective uh, these basic elements would be in reducing emissions, um, as well as whether there are you know, different criteria we should be considering um, or whether we've gotten uh, those parameters um, right in terms of effectiveness and, and cost. Um, I would say that you know, these technologies are really broadly supported um, and you know, from industry to states to NGOs, um, we were urged before the proposal came out to provide a role and a pathway um, for those technologies. Um, and I've gotten some positive feedback um, on uh, you know, the, the recognition of the um, uh, important role those technologies can play as part of this program. Um, I think it's a bit early to say, you know, we just haven't had a chance to, to review all the public comments, obviously. I, I think it's a bit early to say, um, you know, whether um, we might wanna revisit or, or modify, you know, some elements of, of that framework. Um, and the supplemental proposal is, uh, as I mentioned, a really important vehicle that will let us kind of um, essentially have a dialogue with, with stakeholders and with the public, um, incorporate that public input uh, and try to make sure that we, that we get these features right. Great, thank you. Um, this, there's a, a, another question um, in the chat regarding a, a specific data source, um, but I think the question really um, is around the use of the Tropomi data, uh, but that where, for, uh, it, which captures large releases um, that, and where they were confirmed for the oil and gas operator. They said in many cases, the releases were intentional, planned and defended. Um, and I don't know, you know, and probably many of you have, um, you know, have interacted uh, with folks around releases or leaks. Um, and so I'm just curious the, the responses that you've received. Um, and so anyone who like Riley or, Tomas or Stephanie, I think you know, probably this falls more on the regulatory side of things, but what kind of reactions you've gotten uh, when, when data have, have shown uh, releases? Yeah, I, I, there's two parts of this question I wanna be clear on though. I think we can be careful not to conflate them um, because I think I, I've seen two questions here in the chat. One is specific to tropomi right, in, this, in the satellite. And the other one is, I think, a more general question of how are operators responding when they're notified. I just want to be clear, with the current, with using this particular electrophomy, it's designed to monitor the whole plant daily to give better understanding of regional emissions. It's not designed, nor is it capable of finding individual facilities, except when there's a really big event. So, for example, one of the examples I think Aaron's pointing out is tropomi has detected blowouts where there's been a loss of control at a well site and we see 
50, 100 plus tons an hour. And in that case, you can be, we know where the blowouts happen because they're a big event. People on the ground know. In many other cases, when you see a big blob of methane in a wide angle satellite like that, it's not always readily apparent who it is. I'll also say, but there's another paper coming out uh, in, in the near term that we're co-authors on that's an embargo that looks at this question more globally. And I have to say that there are a large number of very high emission events that happen around the planet that are short-lived that are planned. We think they're probably due to maintenance activities. And so those are planned. And so you can debate whether they're a process emission or, or a leak. Um, but I think that I just want to clarify that's separate from my general and how do operators respond when they're going to measure. Thank you. I, Stephanie, it sounded, yeah. Please. Yeah, and, and I can respond a little bit. Um, so I've been working for about 14 years, uh, really focused in oil and gas. And so I've had a lot of time to have a lot of really intentional conversations with oil and gas operators about these various questions. Um, over the years, we've heard that argument kind of over and over again. Um, we've, we've got a permit, we're allowed to admit those um, for this process. And it's true um, to, an ex to the extent that they don't have any control requirements or capture requirements on regulation, they potentially do have the ability to emit those with no controls. And so that's where, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, we have really attempted to kind of hone in um, over time on those. We also have a very rigorous leak detection and repair program, but we acknowledge that not everything they're going to see out there is a leak. Um, they're going to see planned maintenance activities. We are going to see those in this overhead. I mean, Riley mentioned one earlier uh, that we saw, it was on purpose. It was a well unloading event and they were doing that on purpose. But the what we're trying to do with our regulatory program is one, the reporting aspect, they have to actually report all of those. They have to accumulate them across their year and they have to report them now in a way that they've been able to kind of dis disregard them historically. And by being able to disregard them, we were never getting them into the inventory. So now they have to account for all of those. And two, we are with the uh, rulemaking that we just passed last, or that was just passed by our commission last December, we really focused on kind of two elements. One, we wanted to look at leak detection and repair and have that be increased, but we acknowledge there, there are so many things that are happening and pigging and pigging blowdowns are one of them where you've got pigging activities and they're opening up and they're releasing just a little bit every time they open up to remove a pig or add a pig in. And those are things that are happening kind of throughout throughout the month. Um, and so, and they're not necessarily at a facility. Um, they can be, but they're not always. And so we have requirements in our new rule on pigging activities. We have well unloading requirements. I think that we have, we have discovered that well unloading is a significant source of emissions in certain situations. And uh, it's been kind of unrepresented in our inventories historically. And so that's something we're really focused on. We're also looking pretty extensively, we created a new program around um, enclosed combustion devices, which are the control devices. Uh, we've long assumed that they're getting 95% control. Um, and I think in, in most cases, they probably are, but where they're not, they're getting, it could be significant in terms of the amount of emissions that are coming through that are not being combusted appropriately. And so then you have a lot of methane, you have a lot of VOC that's coming through and not being combusted. And so we created a, a stack testing requirement and a performance improvement or a performance insurance um, assurance requirements around enclosed combustion devices. So we are really trying to tackle it from all of those angles so that we are not just assuming that it's okay to emit when they're doing their normal maintenance practices. We've also got rules on our books about tank gauging. So another thing that they commonly do is they have a storage tank and every time they wanna do loadout, 
they go and open the thief hatch and it, it just lets everything that's in train in the top of that uh, storage tank just lets it out. It doesn't go to the flare anymore. It's going out because they have to look <laughs> into it and then they dip something into it to collect a sample to say, is this saleable, saleable oil? And so we want them to not open those thief hatches. And so we've, we're, we have requirements around having ports so that they can get, collect that information and do the, the job that they need to do without actually opening those. So there's, there's a lot, um, especially on an oil and gas side that can be done to reduce the opportunity for emissions, not just capture emissions. <laughs> so. I'll just uh, quickly jump in and, and say that I, I think Stephanie just gave a masterclass and why like from a regulator's perspective, um, even though we have, you know, so many kind of proven and cost-effective solutions and exciting developments in, in monitoring technology, um, from a regulatory perspective, it's still just a really challenging sector to address because each site is different. There are so many complex sources. There's a mix of kind of unintentional and, and, and intentional releases. And Colorado just has, you know, really long experience now um, in over time kind of progressively implementing more and more protective, you know, approaches that that get at more and more of this problem. Um, and we at EPA have tried to, to learn from that experience. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly note that, you know, the proposal that we issued in November um, does, does uh, establish standards for the first time uh, for liquids unloading, um, which is, I think Stephanie mentioned is, is a really important source of emissions in Colorado. Um, and, you know, we've also tried to define what a leak is um, in a way that's expansive. And so that um, ensures that when operators are undertaking routine monitoring, that they're doing it in a way um, that uh, definitely um, includes monitoring at, uh, of equipment and storage vessels um, like thief hatches, um, that includes monitoring of flares that um, we know often don't perform uh, in the manner that, that's, um, that we expect them to as regulators. Uh, and we're also taking comment on whether there's additional safeguards we can, we can include specifically for flares uh, to ensure that they perform um, as well as they're expected to in the field. Um, I'll also just note that we are taking comments on, a, on what we've laid out as a concept in the proposal. It's not actually um, a part of the regulatory requirements that we propose, but we call it a community monitoring program. And the intent here is to um, actually try to, try to leverage some of the great work that um, researchers, that communities are undertaking um, to try to detect these high emission events. And, and, the, and the concept that we've solicited comment on is whether you know, EPA should essentially create a mechanism by which uh, these high emission events, when they're detected by anyone, whether it's by uh, regulators, whether it's by uh, a community monitoring effort, um, whether it's by researchers, um, whether we should create a mechanism where you know, those emitting events can be documented, um, reported uh, in a way that uh, uh, triggers an obligation on the part of an oil, of an oil and gas company uh, to actually investigate um, and, you know, where there's um, a violation, you know, take corrective action. Uh, so we're, that, that may be one, one area where in the supplemental proposal we, we build out further and actually, um, you know, include um, proposed, um, you know, regulations um, based on public input. Um, but I think that that really speaks to, um, you know, the, the, the good work that we've seen um, and, um, you know, the kinds of efforts that we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. um, to try to um, not just detect, but really kind of um, uh, attribute uh, these high emission events. Great, thank you. I know we're getting close to the end of our time, but I have two questions I wanna try to squeeze in. One um, quickly, I will actually direct to you, Riley, which is around um, methane satellite um, measurement and just that there are multiple initiatives, public and private underway. And just, I don't know if you could speak at all to how they're coordinated, you know, how they're working together. Yeah, that's a great question. I at the COP in Glasgow uh, organized um, at the Methane Pavilion, uh, which included representatives from Methane Sat, uh, GHG Sat, Carbon Mapper, and a French company, Keros, which uses the Tropomi data among other open source data sets. Uh, the short answer is um, it is uh, voluntary coordination. Um, as you point out, there are many spacefaring nations, you know, funded agencies that are fielding satellites, include, uh, including methane capable satellites, including China, uh, the European Union, um, the Japanese Space Agency, the US, and others. Um, there are also, as you point out, um, 
nonprofit organizations such as Carbon Mapper um, and, and Methane Sat, which are being launched. There are for profit entities uh, uh, like GHG Sat. And Carbon Mapper is a hybrid. We have, we both have a, a public sector and a private sector component. Um, so at the moment, um, I think, and this is appropriate given that methane's an all hands on deck problem for humanity is that you're seeing many actors act in parallel. And I think that's preferable to trying to get a coherent plan together uh, and then fund everything. And so um, the trick is, um, is coordinating. And so there's two ways people are coordinating. One is we're, uh, we're helping each other plan where to where to point the satellites and how to observe together. And there's actually a, a phrase called tip and cue. If satellite A sees something interesting, they let the other satellites know so we can follow up. And that's actually been done with one of these blowout examples I mentioned. And the other way we're coordinating is how do you bring the data together to harmonize it uh, to address the differences in the systems. And there's a major international program called IMEO, International Methane Emissions Observatory. There are other programs funded by or, or coordinated by the, the World Meteorological Organization. And I think there's a lot of room for the US to do more. And, and you will see CARB doing more of this in California. They're taking a major role uh, in, you know, in doing this kind of coordination within California. And I think um, I'm hopeful we'll see signs of the same with the US government uh, in the next year or so. Great, thank you. Um, and so one last question, and I know there's a few more in here. I think there's one, Tomas, if you have it handy, someone wanted a link to the EPA Community Monitoring Initiative. I don't know if that exists, if that was able to be put into the chat. Well, it's uh, uh, described in the proposed rule. I was about to send out a link to it. Um, okay. I'll do that now. Terrific, thank you. Um, and then the last question I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna actually, I'm, gonna, I'm sure everyone has something to say about it, um, but I wanna start, um, Gabrielle, with you, uh, given everything we've heard, and I think you made such a strong case to kick us off of the urgency of um, reducing emissions, and Riley just saying it's on all hands on deck. We saw lots of activity at COP26. Um, what should we expect a year from now, or a little less than a year from now at COP27? What do you think we'll be seeing? So the good news is that with some of the declarations that came out of COP26, we know that at least the US and China have laid out a number of uh, milestones in their joint declaration. So the first is a ministerial, I believe in the first half of this year uh, to discuss what's in the ministerial, including uh, some of the work that was identified uh, together on methane. And uh, China was going to work on their, uh, their national uh, methane action plan. I believe this year as well, ahead of COP27. So stay tuned for those. And then of course, we were just hearing the United States has a lot happening domestically. So I uh, would imagine that there should be more coming uh, from, from the US. There's a lot of action in Europe as well on this in the regulatory space. Um, and then uh, uh, countries are, are working on updating their nationally determined contributions. There have been a lot of progress towards inclusion of methane in those NDCs. And then as countries start doing working on the stock take, what I personally hope is that uh, they will uh, put some uh, thought into this issue of how their actions are uh, impacting the pace of warming over the next 20 years, in addition to essentially the longer term impacts of warming. So I think there's a real opportunity to start to clarify and understand how the different types of commitments are affecting uh, the trajectory of warming on this planet. Great, thank you so much. And I am looking at the time. It is just about 5.30 PM California time. So I know we're reaching the end of our time. If um, Tomas, Riley, or Stephanie, if you all have anything you wanna add around sort of looking ahead in just a few seconds, if there's something you wanna make sure you, you're able to capture, please go ahead. I'll, I'll just say quickly that, you know, even though the, the challenge ahead of us is clear, um, in terms of the, you know, both at, at the global and national level, um, you know, the volume of methane reductions that, that we really need to achieve as part of a, a coherent climate strategy. Um, we also have just huge opportunities and there are lots of exciting developments. Um, and that includes, uh, you know, uh, technology developments. Um, it includes the political commitments that we saw in the Global Methane Pledge um, and that we've seen at both the national and subnational level here in the U.S. Um, uh, and 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 uh, just you know broad public interest in this in this issue, 
um, which I think just uh, recognizes both the, the climate and broader you know, benefits of, of methane action. So um, it's an exciting time to be, to, to be doing this work and there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful. Um, even as we know, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> I would just add quickly that, um, you know, some of the questions we got were along the lines of how do people respond? And I think one of the areas that could be most fruitful for collaboration between not just California and China, but between organizations and, and jurisdictions is to focus on building avenues that we can have constructive dialogues about emissions and about what we do with them. Um, I think the cops are necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, we need to be talking more frequently than once a year and probably more informally than the, the big events that they are. I think there are there is some talk of doing this around methane, about maybe doing a ministerial in advance, but I, I would encourage more informal collaborations. And I would just say to all of our colleagues from China who were, who were dialed in, uh, there's, there's a huge appetite in the U.S. Uh, on establishing collaborations and working institution to institution. And so I think more than anything, finding a way to share information and, and, and have productive dialogues if effectively, particularly informal uh, collaboration is, is, is where we really need to focus and, and we're hoping to do some of that. Great, Stephanie? Uh, sure, just to, to close out, um, agreed on the co communication. I think, uh, you know, we are going to be in, in Colorado, we have a lot of the same legislative uh, or statutory requirements around agriculture and protections around agriculture that have made it difficult to to pursue emission reductions in those areas and so that's going to be something that I think we're all really interested in understanding how we, how we can approach those in in reasonable and uh, yet quick ways um, you know what we've also experienced is you know one benefit of of particularly for oil and gas uh, reduction technologies that we're, we've been talking about is that you're also getting ethane, which is is a greenhouse gas and has its own contr contributions. And so you're getting some ethane reductions there as well. And so that's one thing I just want to point out that that's not typically wrapped into the greenhouse gas in terms of all of our goals, but it is a benefit that we're getting out of doing a lot of those oil and gas uh, work. And then the last thing I'll close with is that I completely agree that we have to get these methane reductions and we have to get them sooner and CO2 is important, but at the same time, CO2 is harder to reduce um, and from a regulatory standpoint. And so it's the, we have to start that process now and that long-term planning now, because otherwise we're not going to get there by 2050. And so I just recommend um, that you're already thinking about CO2, even if that's not your immediate action plan. Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you for everyone who stuck with us for a few extra minutes. Um, Gabrielle, Riley, Tomas, Stephanie, thank you so much for your presentations and all of the expertise and insights you shared. Um, hopefully this is the start of a, a number of conversations that I know we at the California China Climate Institute want to be having around methane in partnership with all of you and many others who are on the webinar. Um, so thank you again. Thank you for everyone who joined us. Uh, this again has been recorded. It will be available on CCCI's website, um, but please look for future events and we hope to continue engaging you in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.